So this, uh, this year, um, if we could have the first of the slides up, that would be great. Um, this year, um, the sort of the, the, the big, bold um, uh, claim or phrase or prayer that we're going to be um, sticking with as a church family is this idea of being of here on earth, growing outposts of heaven here on earth. So in other words, if it's like it in heaven, we want it here. If it's like it where God lives most fully and most purely, then we want it where we are. Um, take what is there, and we want to see that here. And it's based, uh, that, that is a bold prayer, it's a big prayer, but it's also a prayer we've been encouraged to pray. Uh, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If God knows it in heaven, we want to see it here. And specifically, uh, this month, we've been looking all at worship, haven't we? And what worship in heaven looks like. And this idea of um, worship being as in heaven, so here on earth. And so we've been looking at some of these little um, snippets and snapshots of what heavenly worship looks like in the book of Revelation. Um, and, and asking what that might look like here. And today we're going to be carrying on with that. And the, the, the title I've been given to speak about is the idea of a united worship. What it looks like for, uh, for, for God's people to be united in worship. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. There is diversity in this group of people, but there is also a deep unity in these group of people. That's the passage we're going to look at, and I'll read the rest of that uh, passage in a moment. But what I want to do today is I want to do a bit of a compare and contrast between what we're going to read in this passage in Revelation and another picture, which is also of people coming together, of people uniting but actually what they're uniting for isn't good. And that's found in the book of Genesis, right? The other end of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 11. Um, and it's the story um, of the Tower of Babel. And I will be uh, reading both of those, and then we're going to do a little bit of a compare and contrast. But this is all about when people come together. And one of the things that we often do when we come together is we celebrate things. If we want to celebrate something, we get people together for a party. If we want to celebrate a marriage, we get all of our friends and our family there. If we want to celebrate a birthday, we get people round. If we want to celebrate King Jesus, we choose to come together to do that here. We'll just allow that to carry on. We, when we come together, it sort of amplifies what we might do by ourselves. My birthday's coming up, 34, for those who are asking. Um, my birthday's coming up, and I could sit at home all day by myself and celebrate the fact that I've got a bit older, but it would probably be a little bit weak and, to be honest, sad. But because I want to celebrate that, I'm going to have some people around. We're going to do something together. Because when we come together, it can amplify what we might have on our own. And it can amplify good things. It can also amplify bad things. Group think. That idea of people coming together and there's a really good idea, only it's not a good idea, but they think it is, and they manage to talk themselves into it, and then they go and talk to someone else, and they share this wonderful, brilliant idea that they've all convinced one another is brilliant, and then they discover it's not as soon as they get a third-party opinion. What we can do on our own gets amplified when we do it together. And we're going to see that in both of these stories play out in quite different ways. But true... Worship, true united worship, is all about celebrating with one voice, celebrating one name, and celebrating one victory. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So let's dive into these passages, shall we? So Revelation chapter 7 and verses 9 to 17. I'd encourage you, if you have a Bible, a physical Bible with you, to keep a sort of thumb in both ends in Revelation and in Genesis, because we're going to be going a bunch between. If you're looking at a Bible on your phone, then you could screenshot one and use an app for another or, or whatever. Um, I refer to this, by the way, as the preacher's double nightmare. Preacher's nightmare is when you're preaching from either the very beginning of the Bible or the very end of the Bible, and your Bible is in danger of sort of closing partway through preaching. I've got that twice today, which is why I've printed out the verses just in case. Anyway, um, Revelation chapter 7, starting at verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation, the great trouble. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they, be, will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is a picture, of, a beautiful picture of united worship around the throne of God in heaven. We've already, uh, in our time together, uh, worshipped God in lots of different languages. We've had different languages with Af- Afrikaans and, and Ukrainian and uh, Korean and, and Cantonese and all kinds of different languages, but all pursuing one Jesus. That's an image of what's going on here. Like I said, I want to compare and contrast with another image, which is also where people come together with unity, but that unity leads them in the wrong direction. This is Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, and it's all about people building something. And we read this. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come. Let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over over all the earth. And they stopped building the city. That's why it was called Babel, which literally just means Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. It's a strange story, isn't it? It's a bit of an odd one. It's a bit of a weird one. I hope that as we compare and contrast these two passages in the Bible, each will end up shining a light on the other, and we'll be able to see something of what unity is meant to be about, of what diversity is meant to be about, of what worship and unity towards Jesus is meant to be about. First, united worship is about celebrating with one voice. Those verses we've heard a number of times this morning... There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, and they cried out in a loud voice. Lots of languages, a voice. Lots of different people, a voice. These are people coming together, and they're different from one another, different cultures, different languages, different ethnicities, different nationalities, Lots of difference in them, but they come and they're able to say one thing. I don't know about you, I'm curious how this is going to work at a technical level. How's it going to work? I mean, this morning we heard the similar things being said in different ways, but they were said sort of one after another. How do lots of people come together and say one thing together, even though they're bringing lots of different languages? The Bible doesn't seem to think of this as a big problem. Um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The solution there is what's known as a Babel fish. You put this weird fish in your, in your ear, and suddenly everyone can understand everyone. It's a great plot device if you're an author trying to get around having to uh, translate everything every time. 
If you're in the world of Doctor Who, then the way it's done is that the TARDIS uh, has this magical, wonderful function where, again, everyone can just understand each other if they're nearby the TARDIS. This is very helpful for screenwriters who don't want to have to use subtitles or to invent a new language every time they invent a new alien species. In the Bible, I think what we see is on the day of Pentecost, we see this happening. When on the day of Pentecost, for those of you who remember, Peter is preaching, and he'd have been preaching in Aramaic, it's the language he spoke, but everyone who was there from different nations heard it in their own voice. I think that's probably what's going on in Revelation. What's going on in heaven right now is that people come and they are able to proclaim in their own heart language, and yet everyone hears it as one united voice. I think it's a wonderful, beautiful picture. Because in Christianity, in the Bible, that diversity of language is not seen as a barrier to be overcome, but is seen as something that is a good thing that brings greater beauty and vibrancy. It's one of the differences, by the way, between Christianity and Islam. In Islam, the the one correct language to read and study and speak the Quran is Arabic. The Quran is not really meant to be translated. There is a language that will be spoken in paradise, and it is Arabic. And other people need to sort of uh, learn or embrace that in order to then be able to approach Allah. That's the belief and understanding of Islam. Whereas in Christianity, we don't need to do that. We bring our own cultures and our own languages and our own difference, and together we point that in one direction towards Jesus. We celebrate with one voice, even though we might have many different tongues. This is true for other aspects of who we are as well, our socioeconomic background, maybe our political views, maybe our age, maybe our gender, all of these different things that can be used to create division and difference come together, and as long as they are pointed towards Jesus, they become a unifying thing instead of a dividing thing. Diversity is not the goal. Unity is not the goal. Jesus is the goal. It's not about saying, well, as long as we're all in this together, everything's okay, because we might be in this together in the wrong direction, which is where we come to our story in Babel. These are a group of people who had one voice, and in fact, they had one language. But true diversity and true unity in worship for us is not about us all having one language. It's about us celebrating all in one direction towards one God with one voice. These people had the benefit that we don't have. They all spoke the same language. In our world today, there's so much division and and, and, and difference that's caused by lots of different things, including cultural differences. They didn't have that. And you might think, fantastic, they had perfect unity. But what they did with that unity was very, very bad. There was a lot of groupthink going on for them. Unity is not the goal. Unity towards Jesus was and is. Diversity is not the goal either. In our world today, diversity is is, is heralded and held up as a value and as a virtue in itself. That if we, have, if we embrace one another's differences, if we affirm our differences across every spectrum, whatever it might be, then that surely is the best way for a society to run. Diversity is not seen in the Bible as something that is dangerous, but it's also not the goal. The goal in these diverse voices is that they then come together and are harnessed in one direction towards Jesus with one voice. Unity is not the goal. Diversity is not the goal. One voice towards Jesus is the goal, that this be harnessed in the right direction towards him. That's where we come to uh, the, the second thing I want to share, is that united worship celebrates one name, because these people who come together with all of their differences and all of their different cultures come together and they declare, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They know who it is that they're worshiping, and it's not themselves. No matter who you are, the focus is on him. These are people who are coming, and there's diversity of of culture, as we've already seen, but there's also diversity of, of who these people are. 
You've got uh, this, this group of people includes angels. It includes this great multitude of people. It includes elders, so people who have some kind of leadership role within this um, multitude, within this crowd. You've got some uh, living creatures who are these um, strange beings that we don't have uh, on earth but do live in heaven. And all of these different groups of people come together and they add their amen to what each other are saying, which means they're agreeing with one another. And they're all directing their praise towards Jesus. All of these things... All of these different people, all of these differences between people come together to celebrate one person. And it's not anyone who's around the circle, it's the one who's at the very center of everything. All of those identities that people bring, they're not held as the most important thing. They're put down in service and in favor of Jesus. And I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Last verse of the song we just sung. I will rise, yes, I will rise up, but I'll do it among a great crowd of other people, which I will in some ways disappear into, because my identity isn't the most important thing. Me living my best life isn't the most important thing. It's that we together are directed towards Jesus, our gaze transfixed on his face, triumphing his name instead of our own name. What is it that the people in Babel said? Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the whole face, the face of the whole earth. For them, it's important that their name is big, that they are the impressive ones. And they want to not just know that, but they want to build a monument to that. They want to enshrine who they are in brick and in mortar so that others will see and go, these are impressive people. So that they can remind themselves that they are impressive people so that they might have a great name. For them, their identity needed to be retained and held onto and clung onto and turned into this monument instead of laid down before Jesus. United worship isn't about me, and it's not about you, and it's not about Gold Hill, and it's not about the Baptist Union or the Church of England or Great Britain or Europe. It's not about any of those things. True united worship can only be united if it's not about us, and it's all about Him. Not because your differences don't matter, not because your identity doesn't matter, but because it's, they, it's that they are, they are fully found only in Him. They're fully made beautiful only when they are submitted to Him, when His name is more important than your name, when His name is more important than our name. There's a humility there, and we have to ask that question. Are we wanting to be at the center of it all, or are we willing to lay down and let Him be at the center of it all? The final big difference I see and the final thing that that I see in these verses in Revelation about what united celebration of Jesus looks like is that it celebrates one victory and one victory alone. These are people who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. This comes when one of these elders comes to John who's seeing this vision and asks, these people who are in white robes, Who are they and where have they come from? Where have they come from? Interesting question. John doesn't say, well, uh, they come from lots of different tribes and nations and, and languages and tongues. This one's from here and this one's from there. Because he knows that actually what has brought them together, where they truly come from, is that they come from Jesus. That Jesus himself has led them to this point because they're the ones who... In this language, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people who come with all kinds of different um, uh, national dresses and all kinds of different um, ways of expressing themselves and all kinds of different things which are wonderful and they are beautiful. But ultimately, they've chosen to take those things off and instead clothe themselves in something that isn't tainted by anything else and is only pure because of what Jesus has done, that Jesus, in his death on the cross, as his blood was poured out, made a way for us, for you and me, to be clean before God, for the wrong we've done to be righted, for the sin to be forgiven. That's the only thing 
that can really unite these people. So it's the way that John describes them. That's who they are. They're people who've come out of this great time of trouble, and they've washed their robes and made them white, and therefore they are before the throne of God. That is what enables them to come together around and before this throne. It is what he has done. It's also what he continues to do. That's why, uh, as we carry on reading in verse 15, they serve him day and night in the temple. He who sits on the throne, present tense, will shelter them with his presence. What Jesus has done, what Jesus continues to do to shelter and to preserve and protect, and then what Jesus will continue to do. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. All of those things that Jesus has done is what brings these people together and enable them to praise him with one voice, praising his one name. All of those things that he has done, they require not for us to add to them, but just for us to respond to them. If he has poured out his blood, what's our response? To take our dirty, messy clothes and to wash them clean. If he sits on the throne and preserves and protects us, what's our response? To serve him day and night. If he continues to, to feed us so that never again will we be hungry, never again will we, will, we, will we thirst, what's our response to that? To take the food, to take the water that he gives us and let him sustain us. It's his work that we respond to, not his work that we add to. Compared with these people in Babel, United Worship celebrates one victory, doesn't try and do it, do, do it for ourselves. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. They want God. They want to get to heaven. But they think that rather than heaven needing to come down to them, they can make their way up. And that is a huge difference. In Jesus, we see the need, just celebrated it at Christmas, that heaven would come to us. We're praying here on earth, as in heaven. Heaven come down rather than earth build up. They want to achieve it themselves. They want to get there themselves. They want it so that they have a great name, so that they can be esteemed. But they want to do it themselves. They want their achievement without him, instead of just to respond to what he has already achieved. And what they will achieve will never be enough. God's response to this sounds a little bit strange, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. It's a strange story, isn't it? It's a, it's a weird one. It kind of sounds as though God is saying, well, if we let them do this, They'll be able to do a lot, and then they won't need us anymore. They won't need me anymore, so I'm going to have to thwart them right now, right here. Because he's worried that what if they do get to heaven? What if they do make their way up to heaven by themselves, and then they have no need of me? That's not what's going on at all. You don't have to read too far into the Bible to realize that that, that just doesn't make sense of this story. God isn't worried that people are going to be able to do it themselves. What God is trying to stop is for people thinking they can and trying to. Because as long as these people, like I, like I said before, when we come together, what's in us gets amplified. What's in them is a desire to be good enough, to make a way, to achieve something, to be good enough, to, 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 to defeat sin or, or, or to, 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 to make their way to heaven. That's what I want to do. I want to achieve. I want to be successful. I want to be like God. And then we come together and that just amplifies and we all want to do that. And God is saying, well, as long as they're constantly amplifying this wrong thing in them and working together towards it, they're not going to stop trying. And as long as they're trying to do it for themselves, they certainly won't turn to me and look to me for the help that I desperately want to give them and that they desperately need to receive. They want to achieve it themselves. God knows they can't, but he also knows that we'll keep on trying. And so he says, I'm going to make it a little harder. And he creates these differences of language and culture and society and nationality. Starts with language. And he creates these differences. 
And in this passage, it's seen as something that makes life harder and makes the people working together more difficult. And it is. We don't have to look around too hard to see how the differences between one people group and another can be negative, can create negativity, can create judgmentalism, can create racism, can lead one group to enslave another group, can lead one group to despise or be jealous of another group, where misunderstanding leads to mistreatment. That's just true where people are different, either on this spectrum or all kinds of different spectrums. Where people are different, we in our sinful nature, that will lead to disunity. But when we come through the blood of Jesus, through what he has done, through his victory and focus on his name, then these differences go from being something that needs to be a barrier between one person and another and being something that can be beautiful. Because where in this story in Genesis, these divisions are, are, a, are a difficult thing for humanity because of the wrong that's within them, in Revelation, these differences are a beautiful part of humanity brought to Jesus and restored by him. We need not be afraid of diversity and of difference. It's not the goal, but it's also not something that should scare us. When we come to Jesus, when we focus on him, when we commit to his one name instead of our own, when we focus on what he has done instead of trying to do it for ourselves, where we speak with one voice because it's all about him and we're all saying the same thing to him, that is what united worship looks like. And it will always be a choice. On Thursday, as uh, this evening, Josh and Flory, who are going to be leading uh, worship this evening, they were leading on Thursday, and they came around to ours for dinner afterwards, and we were chatting. And I was was just, I noticed on Thursday that a number of the songs that we were singing included phrases like, I just want to worship, or I really want to praise you. And the good news was that on Thursday, I did want to. So those didn't cause any barrier for me. But I'll be honest, often, or maybe not often, but sometimes, I'll come and those, those words can present a barrier to me because I don't really want to worship Jesus that day. Or because I don't want to praise him. Not because he's done anything wrong, but because there's something in me that, that means that actually I just can't be bothered that day or, or I'm struggling with something. We were talking about the fact that we could rewrite some of those as I just choose to praise you. Or I will choose to lift your name on high. Because that's something that I can always choose to do. Not slamming any of those songs. I'm not saying they're they're wrong and there'd be another version that's right. But I just noticed it on Thursday. Worship is always a choice. Worshipping united with other people who you might feel are different from you is a choice. Choosing his name instead of your own name is a choice. Choosing not to try and achieve things for yourself, but trusting in him because he already has, is a choice. It's a choice that to lift our eyes from your situation, from yourself, from what you've done. And you might have done wonderful things. You have. I know a lot of you have. We've, as a church, there are wonderful things that we've done. But as soon as we start to focus on that, we've lost the game. It's a choice to celebrate. But boy, is it a choice worth making. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When I'm reminded of things like that, when I choose to remind myself of things like that, and lift my eyes from me to him, That's when I start to want to worship. It's a choice that then leads to something in us. And when we can remind one another of those things and do this together, then we might want to worship, yes, through singing, but also through our lives and through all the different things that we will do as we we step forward with Jesus. So let me pray, and I'll invite the band to come back and join and continue to lead us. But let me pray.
Lord God, it's not about me. It's not about this church. I'm sorry for the times when I think if I'm really clever and make bricks that are really, really strong, that I'll be able to lay enough on top of one another to build something that is strong enough to hold my weight as I try and climb my way out of the problems that I find myself in, as I try and climb my way up to where you belong. We're sorry for the times when as a church we've relied on or tried to build our own name or reputation. It's not about us. It's about you. So we choose whether in this moment we really want to or not, Lord, we choose to focus on your name, to call to mind what you have done, what you are doing and what you promise you will continue to do, including those words on the screen right now. We choose to focus on that. And whatever differences we have, whatever um, examples of this, th this diversity that can be a barrier but in you becomes beautiful, we choose to bring all of that together and gather around your throne. We choose to worship you. And we choose to do it together. And I ask, Lord, that you would be stirring up by your spirit in different people's hearts here and joining online, something that because we are together might be amplified and that it would be pleasing to you. So we choose now to worship you. Thank you, Lord. Would you come by your spirit and would you lead us on? Amen. As we, as we sing, can I encourage you to, to, to make whatever choices you need to make, to, to say to God whatever it is that you need to say. But then also, if there's something that is in you, whether it be a, a scripture or a word or something um, that God is sort of um, downloading into you, um, a, a word or a picture or an encouragement or a, or a tongue that you haven't learnt, can I encourage you to share that? Maybe you want to come and speak to, speak to Stephen or to, to, to me, um, and we can help work out how, how that might be amplified, because when we are together, some of these things in us, they're not just for us. Don't hold on to them. Let them, let them out. Let them, let them for, for the people that they're intended for. Let's focus on Jesus, and as we do, let's respond and receive from him, and then let's give that to one another in beautiful difference.